I want to first thank Adam Kane, uh, the executive director here at the museum, and Drew Bush and the whole team that has helped host us here with Carolyn Wesley, our network managers, uh, help. This is particularly uh, uh, meaningful for me to be in this location. So as Ian mentioned, I grew up in the Upper Valley. I grew up in Fairley, just down I-91. And uh, my, one of my first memories at uh, six years old, our first school trip was coming up here to the Fairbanks and um, have brought my son, who's five, I think three times already. It's definitely a special part of uh, for me, and I, I know for my son as well, in terms of our uh, education about the natural world and natural history, and it's really uh, a Vermont treasure that we're lucky to have. So really glad to be here tonight with all of you, and huge thanks to Anne for moderating and Vermont Digger for this partnership. Um, this is the second in a two-part series that we started. Um, the first was a conversation about the future of transportation in Vermont that we did earlier this spring down in White River Junction. Um, and uh, Representative White was there, I see you're smiling about that. Um, and you know, the, the goal of this really is to just help increase awareness about some of the key topics related to Vermont's energy future, how it affects um, us economically as individual Vermonters, how it affects our state economy, and how it affects our ability to meet um, the important commitments and goals the state has set in terms of become, using more renewable energy and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I'm just going to give an opening kind of context setting presentation um, and then the highlight, the main part of the show is we've got four experts uh, who will form our panel. You can see their name placards uh, there um, and, and Anne will moderate the discussion with them um, shortly. But to get started, first a word about uh, Energy Action Network. Uh, I think about half the folks who are here tonight are network members, half um, I don't recognize as much, but we are a very diverse network of businesses, organizations, utilities, fuel dealers, colleges and universities, basically any entity in Vermont that wants to come together to both understand how we can make progress towards Vermont's energy and climate commitments and make progress together um, in, in working towards them, uh, specifically uh, the state's comprehensive energy plan and our goal of 90% renewable by 2050, and many of the state's commitments to reduce emissions. There are, there are different ones. The, the one that is most, uh, uh, or the, the, that is the closest to us in time is our commitment uh, to uh, reduce uh, emissions by 2025 in line with the Paris Agreement commitment. Um, that, that Governor Scott made. Um, so in addition to all of the organizations and businesses that make up EAN, we also have a number of public partners, <coughs> some of whom are here tonight from the Department of Public Service, other state agencies and departments, uh, regional planning commissions, cities and towns, um, and we work together to try to collect data and information that helps make our total energy, our comprehensive energy story uh, accessible and, and intelligible and actionable for, for Vermonters. So this, these slides just show a few examples of some of this is uh, not all apologies if your logo is not up here. This is just an example of um, some of the members of our network. And those members, or I should say the business and organizational members, um, set a uh, mission for their network, Energy Action Network is, is really those organizations and, and more. And the mission that they set together is to achieve Vermont's 90% renewable by 2050 total energy commitment and to significantly reduce Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions in ways that create a more just, thriving, and sustainable future for Vermonters. To support that network, um, about six years ago, a small nonprofit organization was created that we also call EAN. Um, that exists to serve as a neutral convener of diverse stakeholders. So all of those member organizations that you see have, are committed to Vermont's long-term goals, but individually there are different uh, opinions and perspectives on the best way to get there. And so the, our, organ, our small nonprofit organization commits to serving as a neutral convener of that diverse network. We don't do any lobbying, and we serve as an independent, trusted tracker of uh, progress towards the goals that the network has set working in coordination with state and federal data partners, among others. We also convene meetings, 
um, and facilitate communication across the network and are really glad to be moving into more uh, public communications in partnership with, with Vermont Digger beyond, beyond the network. So what I want to do to kick us off this evening is give this overview presentation that really has three parts to it. The first is why does how we heat matter to Vermonters and the Vermont economy? The second is to look into that question from the lens of what does it mean for how we can meet our renewable energy and emissions reduction commitments that the state of Vermont has set. And then, and we'll get into this a lot more in the panel discussion, what are some of the resources, if you're here as an individual, a renter, a homeowner, a business owner, um, a board member of the Fairbanks Museum, and you're wondering how does this apply to me and how can I make my home or building more efficient or take advantage of renewable heating um, options, um, our panelists are really well uh, situated to give you some of that information and advice. Um, so just to start, so this graph or here on the left shows of the total amount of energy that we use as a state to heat our homes and buildings. Where does it come from? The largest source is heating oil. We use, and this is primarily number two heating oil, we use more heating oil per capita than any state uh, in the country except for Maine. Um, so that is the biggest one. Natural gas is about a quarter of our heating energy use, but of course, those of you who are familiar with Vermont Gas's territory know that that's primarily limited to uh, areas of northwestern Vermont that, uh, where Vermont Gas has its territory. The third largest source of our heat energy comes from propane. Um, and uh, then we start getting into um, different types of, of wood heating, including with cordwood, wood chips, wood pellets. Um, this electric heat is a combination of two different kinds of heat that are very different. One, the older, kind of inefficient, resistance type of baseboard electric heat that you may be familiar with, uh, <coughs> still exists in some parts of, of Vermont, but it's largely um, being phased out. Um, and then on the other hand is the much more modern, much more efficient whole climate heat pump systems that have been taking off in, in popularity in, in Vermont. And uh, those are, are more on the rise. Uh, there is also, we have, thanks to the work of the um, Public Service Department and the Department of Forest and Parks, we're starting to be able to track how much of our wood heat comes not just from wood stoves or pellet stoves, but the advanced wood or the automated wood heating systems that allow you to use pellets directly, set a thermostat, and um, it, it works automatically without you loading pellets yourself. So that's the rough overview of our heating sources. I will say that um, you may have heard a statistic like 38% of Vermonters heat with wood which is true. Um, the reason that that doesn't align with this data is because this is looking at 38% of Vermonters heat with wood to some degree. 38% of Vermonters do not rely on wood as their sole or even their primary heating source. Um, so that's why wood shows up as, as for, what is it here, 17%. Uh, um, so that's that piece of it. And then if you look at the, what this means for us as consumers, as people who have to pay heating bills. This chart shows the average uh, prices for different types of heating fuels over the last 20 years. Um, this is data from the Energy Information Administration and the Public Service Department here in Vermont. And what you see is that this purple line and this blue line, on average, generally have the, high, are the highest cost way heat your home and have the most volatile uh, prices, and those are propane and fuel oil. Um, I just looked today at the EIA Energy Information Administration website for uh, the, the latest average residential uh, heating fuel prices for fuel oil and propane, and uh, it said it was $275 a gallon for fuel oil and $261 a gallon for propane. So you might be wondering why, if propane is less per gallon, is it showing up as more expensive on this chart? And that's because what this chart shows is how expensive it is per unit of energy it's delivering to you. And the energy content of propane is only about two-thirds what it is of, of fuel oil. So even though it's a lower price per gallon for propane, the overall cost for the amount of heat energy you get from it um, is, is higher than fuel oil uh, on average historically. In contrast, the 
renewable, the, the heating sources that have been much flatter and more stable and much lower over time have been the renewable options like wood chips and wood pellets, or wood chips and wood pellets. Um, those of you associated with schools in Vermont uh, are probably aware of that. Over a third of Vermont's uh, schools and over half of Vermont's students go to schools uh, heated by wood chips or wood pellets. Um, and a number of increasingly residences and commercial and institutional buildings are heating that way. And then this line here shows um, the cost um, of heating with cold climate heat pumps. Um, which is a very efficient use of electricity. So you see that all of the, the options that, that we can map here in terms of um, the renewable options are, are lower and, and much less volatile. Uh, the last year is um, in terms of the amount, uh, the, the price per BTU is the, the lowest cost on the fossil fuel side, which is uh, natural gas. Um, which you know is the, really the only one of these listed here that's only um, available in one portion of, of the state. Quick question, Jerry. Does this, do these figures take into account the efficiency of the equipment, or is it just the this is just the fuel price? It doesn't look. This does not include the equipment. content of the fuel. Yes. Okay. Um, if it's okay, let's hold questions. Well, uh, just, just a clarifying. Point. I, I actually just contacted Irving Energy yesterday, yeah. and their rack price is two dollars and one cent per gallon for heating oil. So that that's a big difference. So this it, it it really depends on whether you're looking at a wholesale price or a retail price. That's retail. Uh, whether you're part of a, a fuel club or not, this is the average price as reported to the Energy Information Administration. I think as of last week um, was the figures I mentioned. So that, that speaks to kind of what, our, what we pay for how we heat our homes and buildings means in terms of our personal budgets or our business budgets. I want to step back and think about this from the macro economy of the state of Vermont. So when we spend one of our energy dollars on fossil fuel, it depends on what the wholesale versus the retail price is of that fuel, but on average, 70 to 80 cents of every dollar that we spend on fossil fuel leaves the state of Vermont because we import 100% of our fossil fuel. So the money that's spent locally is, you know, pays for some of the, the salaries um, of the delivery truck drivers and the, the um, operations of, of a fuel dealer. But the vast majority of that cost is bound up in the commodity cost of the fuel oil or the propane, and that's going right out of state. Um, oftentimes, uh, to you know, it's, it's a global market, but it includes going to places that um, are not so friendly to uh, our ideals, places that uh, in the recent past have uh, dismembered journalists and uh, inter interfered in our democracy, uh, like Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, while I don't have the infographics to show it here, um, if you go back and compare the amount of dollars that stay in state and recirculate versus dollars that leave the state, um, for, for these, for wood chips, wood pellets, cordwood, and electricity, for all of them, much more money stays and recirculates and help, helps grow our local economy. Wood chips, the vast majority of it stays locally. They're mostly sourced within Vermont or within a 30 to 50 mile radius of, of our border. Um, with wood pellets, it depends where you're getting them from. If you're getting them from Vermont wood pellet in North Clarendon, the vast majority of those dollars are staying local. But even if you're going farther, there's a lot of pellet supply in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, or in Quebec. Those dollars are staying more regionally rather than going to the Gulf Coast or internationally. If you invest in weatherization in your home the, or business, the vast majority of that dollar stays and recirculates locally for uh, weatherization contractors and, and materials. Um, and with electricity, um, Burlington Electric Department uh, just did a study saying when you spend an energy dollar on electricity, say for a cold climate heat pump, how much of that stays right here in Vermont? And what they found is very conservatively, 50 cents of every dollar that you spend with your electric utility stays in state. It goes to things like operations for the utility, uh, line maintenance, uh, 
tree limb clearing, and they found additionally that 75% stays within this northern New England or northeast region. So no matter what the alternative is, if you're reducing your fossil fuel spending through weatherization and or you're switching to another heating source, not only does the fuel cost of that become lower and more stable for you over time, it also has this double benefit of helping to invest and grow the Vermont economy at the same time. We've seen evidence of this from the recent Clean Energy Industry Report that is commissioned by the Department of Public Service by uh, Andrew Perchel, who will speak on the panel. And this gives us a picture of how many clean energy jobs are in Vermont, including folks who work in weatherization, folks who work in with heating, or who uh, work in renewable electricity. Uh, it's a comprehensive measure. And what we've seen over the last five years is a steady increase. It's been one of the fastest growing um, sources of jobs in the state at a time when otherwise we've seen e e some economic malaise. Um, and the average wage of these jobs <coughs> is about $8 an hour higher than the, av the median wage for jobs statewide. So the median statewide is a little over $18 an hour. The median wage for jobs across the clean energy sector is a little over $26 an hour. So these are good, well-paying, family-supporting jobs that were growing um, over 4,000 in the last um, five years. And the ability to continue growing that workforce and that source of well-paying jobs over the next you know, five, ten years, if we start this transition uh, around how we heat our homes, um, it is, is very important. So, with that introduction on some basics around heating, I want to step back and say, how does this connect to Vermont, the goals Vermont has set in terms of renewable energy and in terms of reducing our emissions? So, we have made some steady progress in becoming more renewable as a state in terms of our overall energy use. That's not just thermal energy use, it's also the energy we use for transportation, and it's also the energy <coughs> that we use for electricity. And overall, we're at about 19% overall as a state. Of course, we've set a goal of being 90% renewable by 2050. So if we're going to get there, we're at a point now, an inflection point, where we're going to have to start bending this curve upward and start to making much more substantial rate of progress than we have made in the last decade so that we don't stay on this business as usual curve that doesn't get us anywhere near the goals that we've set for our state, both from an energy and environment perspective, but also from an economic development perspective. Um, as I mentioned earlier, about a year ago, when the President uh, said that he wanted to pull the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement, something he followed through on yesterday, and um, Governor Scott, to his credit, instead said, no, Vermont is still in, um, and became one of a number of states across the country to commit that we were still going to um, uphold the emissions reduction commitments in that global agreement, which would be a 26 to 28 percent reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2025. The challenge is that even though we've made that commitment rhetorically, we, have, we do not yet have the um, resources and the policy framework that would be necessary to actually achieve it. As you can see, we've only reduced our emissions 2% below 2005 levels as of the latest data uh, released from the Agency of Natural Resources. In fact, we're, uh, we've seen our emissions increase 10% in the last two years of data, mostly because of increasing fossil fuel use and how we get around and how we heat our homes and buildings. Um, this puts thermal energy use in the context of total energy use. So as I said, we also have to look at transportation and electricity. You know, the amount of energy we use to heat our homes and buildings, and I should say it's not just about heating. Thermal also includes cooling, but the amount of energy we use to cool <laughs> homes and buildings in Vermont while it's increasing, as we're seeing increasing summer temperatures, is, is still just a fraction of the overall energy that we use overall in thermal energy. Most of it goes to heating through our, through our winters. Um, the emissions that come from that um, uh, are shown here, and this is a total of, our, of all the energy emissions. Um, so a little over a third of the greenhouse gas emissions that come from energy come from how we heat our homes and buildings. 
And in terms of the amount of money, I believe Rebecca will speak to this a little bit uh, more during the panel, that we spend on how we heat our homes and buildings uh, out of our total energy expenditures, it's about a quarter, about the same as what we spend on electricity. Um, so this shows, shows it graphically. Um, these pie charts are scaled to show the amount of energy we use statewide. This is total, um, the, the sum of these three. And you can see that energy use-wise, transportation and thermal are very close together. The reason, one of the reasons that we have lower emissions from, how, from our thermal sector is that it's much more renewable. Um, and we use much more fossil fuel in the transportation sector. The electricity sector has been a great source of, of progress in terms of becoming more renewable, but it's, it's a much smaller source of uh, how much energy we use, so there's a limited amount to which we can make progress towards our comprehensive energy plan goals and towards our emissions reduction goals, unless we also make these sectors more renewable and less fossil fuel dependent at the same time. Often what that means is taking advantage of the renewability of our electric sector by electrifying how we, how we get around and how we heat our homes. Um, but it also means utilizing uh, our energy more efficiently through weatherization, and it also means smartly, sustainably utilizing um, renewable solid and liquid fuels, especially our wood resources uh, like wood chips, pellets, and, and uh, or wood where appropriate. So this breaks down the portion of the renewable energy pies to see you know, where it comes from. So most of the renewability in our heating sector is from cordwood, some from pellet stoves, some from electric heat, some from automated wood heat. Over time, what we want to see is not just this uh, section of the pie grow and have our thermal energy use become more renewable, but also have it become more efficient by utilizing um, the, the efficient and low emitting uh, stoves that we have on the market now and automated wood heating systems. There is a big difference between a pre-1988 EPA certified stove and the emissions profile that it has versus um, an advanced wood heating appliance like the, the modern pellet and wood stoves that uh, you can get incentives for from Efficiency Vermont and uh, electric utilities through, the tier, through um, the programs that they have. So this shows our historical greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont. As I said, we've gone up 10% in the last two years. Um, not quite at our peak back in 2005, but about 10 million um, metric tons of, of pollution um, that's co that comes from our energy use. And you can these dots show what we would have to get to if we were to meet either the Paris commitment that the governor has made or the more ambitious goals that have been set in statute um, previously, um, or that show up in the, in the state's comprehensive energy plan. Whichever goal or commitment you choose, it's clear that we can't keep doing this and we have to start doing this. The only distinction is how fast are we going to do it. Um, this breaks down our emissions by sector, and this doesn't just look at energy, it looks at all greenhouse gas emissions. So the largest comes from transportation, but the next biggest, 28% of all of our emissions come from building thermal energy use. Um, and, and these show um, the others. This is sometimes surprising for people to hear because oftentimes when we think about energy, it's through a, the lens of national media. And national media tends to not talk about uh, fossil fuel use or uh, climate pollution or emissions from um, building energy use because it's, it's a really, um, it's a pretty small piece of where our emissions come from nationally. It's only about 10%. But because of our dependence on things like number two heating oil and propane, in Vermont, residential and commercial fuel use, or basically thermal uh, fuel use, um, is almost a quarter of what our uh, emissions are. So there's the question of where the emissions come from, but then there's also the question of why have we seen such an increase since 1990 in Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions? They're, they've gone up 16% since 1990. And the biggest culprits are increasing fossil fuel use in the transportation sector, but then the next is increasing fossil fuel use 
in, in how we heat our homes and buildings. We've actually seen a net reduction in emissions comparing the year 1990 to the year 2015 in emissions from agriculture, electricity, waste management, um, etc. So these are really the two um, areas that we need to make sure we effectively tackle if we're going to meet have a chance of meeting our state energy uh, and, and emissions reduction commitments um, rather than, as we have for most of the last decade, expecting most of the progress just to come from one uh, sector that we've set regulations and policy around. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, EA and the organization does not do um, any lobbying on behalf of specific policies or bills, but what we do provide is analysis around what it might take in terms of the scale and pace of progress if the state was going to meet these goals or commitments. This is just one example. We're not, we didn't put this forward as a prescription, but what we started with were, are what are the known and proven technologies and what are the best practices where there's peer review <coughs> data around how we can reduce emissions. We started with the goals that the state set in the Comprehensive Energy Plan, which was around 60,000 electric vehicles, um, and a number of, you know, around home weatherization and the number of heat pump systems, etc. When we plugged in the numbers, the goals that the state had set for the Comprehensive Energy Plan, it didn't get us to Paris. So what we did, the, this is the uh, amount needed to reduce, to, to do our part, to, to meet that commitment the governor made to the Paris Climate Agreement. So what we decided to do was to proportionally increase each of those known and proven technologies and best practices across the board until we could hit the emissions reduction commitment that would be necessary. And while this has gotten a lot of attention, replacing 90,000 internal combustion engine vehicles, gas or diesel vehicles, with electric vehicles, if you add up the total emissions reduction opportunity across the thermal sector, it's actually larger than what we modeled in the thermal sector. And it's because no matter where you live in Vermont, no matter what your heating system is, there is an option for you to heat more efficiently and to heat more renewably um, than the fossil fuel status quo. So again, adding all of these up. Um, so. This just gives you a sense of kind of technology by technology. What would that look like by 2025? Um, we're basically the pace for the last uh, six years or so has been we weatherize about 2,000 homes a year. We would need to significantly increase that uh, amount um, if we were to get towards this number. And that is, that's cumulative across the work that 3E Thermal and Efficiency Vermont and uh, the weatherization <coughs> assistance program in Vermont Gas and Burlington Electric that all of our weatherization entities do across the board. Um, we're at uh, just over 25,000 homes weatherized. And we're looking, that would be just, and one thing I should say about this, this is not a menu of options. It's not, we pick one of these and it would get us to the goal. We have to do all of these or their equivalent. If we fall short in one area, we have to make it up somewhere else. And we just modeled, the, the emissions reduction we could get from our energy use, there would also be another uh, part that we have to get from other reductions beyond energy or in addition to these that, that we model. Um, heat pump systems have actually seen an incredible rate of growth um, starting very low in 2013, but you can see as of uh, recent data um, are, have in, gone over 10,000. Um, and we'll, we'll need to continue to, to see that. And I should say, I'll get to this a little bit later, but um, each home, each building, each heating system is different. You know, what's going to work for you, uh, you should definitely talk with a, uh, a heating professional. Um, it's not a question of just picking a technology and sticking in. It really depends on context. Some homes and buildings can be heated exclusively with cold climate heat pumps. Some, you want a combination with, with something else after doing efficiency, and we're seeing more and more complementary systems that involve both wood heating and heat pumps or, or other examples. Um, but this is just a model, and this, this looks at the growth in um, efficient wood heating in terms of both pellet stoves, the darker 
color in terms of uh, those, and also the lighter color shows a projected growth in automated wood heating systems, which I know Andy or Emma will talk about during the panel. Um, those rates of growth of like technology adoption and market transformation, you know, we're seeing a bunch of exponential growth curves here, right? They, it might look a little bit daunting, but I think it's important to step back and realize we've done this before. That, that's the, this is the story of the growth of solar PV across Vermont in the last five years. And it's been the story with any new technology over time, whether it's cell phones or moving from horse and buggy to um, uh, you know, cars in the first place. So this is certainly possible. It's certainly um, what we've seen in, in the past. And there are other examples from across the world that show um, how, how it's happened already. So in Upper Austria, they get about half of all of their heating from renewable sources, um, primarily from automated uh, wood heating systems. They have a population about two times the size of us, a similar climate. But the difference between Upper Austria and Vermont is they set a policy and regulatory framework that required emissions reduction that, that um, either penalized or stopped allowing fossil fuel heating systems to be put into place and instead provided incentives to help folks move to the alternative that was better for their health, better for their uh, budget, their pocketbook, and also better for the environment and, and the climate. But it's a great example, and they say that we, they did it through sticks, carrots, and tambourines. <laughs> I will just note that most of the progress we've seen in terms of an energy sector in Vermont becoming more renewable and reducing its emissions over time has come from the electricity sector. And one of the reasons that is, is because it's the only sector where we have capped emissions. We joined a multi-state agreement um, called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that required us to stay below a certain emissions threshold and then uh, required uh, electricity generation stations to pay into a fund, uh, basically to pay for their allowance to pollute, and then those revenues came to Vermont to invest in things like weatherization um, that have helped bring down energy costs across the state. The challenge is that that is the only energy sector for which Vermont has capped emissions and made a decision to invest resources in providing incentives for folks to move in another direction. Other states and provinces have taken a different approach. They've said, because our emissions and our energy use come from these other sectors, transportation and thermal included, we need to cap emissions and make investments in transforming those sectors too. So California did an economy-wide cap and invest uh, program. Quebec, our neighbors to the north have done the same. I'm not going to stand up here and say which policy direction is the, the best way to go. There are different policy options on the table. It's, it's not my role to, to compare them against each other, but I will say there's a clear message that unless you apply a policy and regulatory framework to cap emissions and then help make investments for folks to switch to the alternative, whether that's investments in low-income weatherization or incentives for renewable and efficient heating systems, there is almost no way that we are going to come anywhere close to the scale and pace of progress that would be required to meet the commitments we've made as a state and also to seize a very real economic development opportunity to keep more dollars in state and reduce consumer energy costs. Um, so with that, I do have some examples of what this means at a, at a very personal level, but I'm realizing I am over time, so I'm going to save those for later, and if anyone wants to walk through what this looks like on an example of an individual home, um, I'd be happy to go through that with you, but at this point, I want to turn it over to Anne for our panel session. Thank you.